Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in, within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. We have a couple announcements. Uh, we've got... You don't mind if I take this off? It's a little, a little hard there to be able to speak. I think I got a good six foot from you, so it'll be okay. Um, we have, if you guys feel led, we have actually increased the uh, occupancy here to 100 people for the chapel. So if you're streaming and you feel like we're maxed out, we've got a little bit of extra space now in the back. We've kind of modified a little bit. So if you feel comfortable coming and uh, want to worship uh, here with us today, you're free to do so. We do have special needs, though. If you wouldn't mind, you'd send the bulletin as well. As we reopen the nursery, there's certain protocols in place to try to divide out kids. Hopefully, we separate them, and so then it needs a little bit more help. So if you feel led to do so, we need extra volunteers. Uh, please let Sarah, Sarah Terrell know, and uh, her email is in the bulletin. And then after our ministry of the Word, we will have the Lord's Supper, in which we... Uh, all can come before the Lord and see, uh, remember him that our life has been redeemed from the pit. And now our teacher, Jeff Brown, he will come and lead us in the scripture. Jeff. Well, good morning. You will notice a few different things today. You notice Joe Terrell doing announcements. I'll be preaching and then Mark Brunger and I will be leading the Lord's Supper. And you may wonder, is this the A team or the B team? You guess which is which, but note, we're singing today, okay? <laughs> so make sure to sing with your mask on. And uh, let's go ahead and open up into 1 Samuel chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4. We're going to look at the whole chapter. Uh, by way of context, the last time we looked, when I taught, we looked at 1 Samuel 3, which talked about the prophetic calling of the boy Samuel. His first assignment, tell Eli the word of God, which was, your priestly line is being destroyed. Your boys are wicked and you will not restrain them. So, today we're going to see 1 Samuel 4, the the outpouring of uh, what happens because of that. So, this is the Word of God. Thus the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to meet the Philistines in battle and camped beside Ebenezer, while the Philistines camped in Aphek. The Philistines drew up in battle array to meet Israel. When the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the battlefield. When the people came into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us look to ourselves from Shiloh, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, that it may come among us and deliver us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh, and from there they carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, who sits above the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. As the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth resounded. When the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What does the noise of this great shout in the camp of the, Lord, of the, of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp. The Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us! Who shall deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who smote the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, or you will become slaves to the Hebrews, as they have become slaves to you. Therefore, be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and every man fled to his tent, and the slaughter was very great, and there fell of Israel thirty thousand foot soldiers." And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. 
Now a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he came, behold, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road, eagerly watching, because his heart was trembling for the ark of God. So the man came to tell it in the city, and all the city cried out. When Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, What does the noise of this commotion mean? Then the man came hurriedly and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were set so that he could not see. The man said to Eli, I am the one who came from the battle line. Indeed, I escaped from the battle line today. And he said, How did things go, my son? Then the one who brought the news replied, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great slaughter among the people. And your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been taken. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell off the seat backward beside the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for he was old and heavy. Thus he judged Israel forty years. Now his daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, was pregnant and about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband had died, she kneeled down and gave birth, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women who stood by her and said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have given birth to a son. But she did not answer or pay attention. And she called the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God was taken. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading of His Word in our time this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come before Your throne and we know that You are a sovereign, great, awesome God. Not only are all things fixed in Your eyes through all eternity, but Lord, we know that also that we can come before You this morning, not as Your servants only, but as children of God. You have made us children of God because the Son that you freely gave, and he would freely give his life for us. Father, we owe you our lives, and we owe you our eternal lives. And fact is, you've made that clear. You've given it to us as a gift in the Son. And Lord, so we pray as we meet this morning, would you grant the church wisdom as we uh, seek to live in these strange times that we are? Thank you for the elders that you have put here that they can govern us and shepherd us. And I pray for the body, uh, all of us, that you would just grant us safety in the midst of these times. But more importantly, would you make us dangerous for the cause of Christ? Would you make us willing and wanting to, uh, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness? Help me today, if you would, as I teach this passage, that you would grant me the wisdom to say what is right and what is clear and what is along the lines of Scripture. And Lord, we uh, thank you for it in advance. In your son's name we pray, amen. So, you may have heard this phrase before. It's called, the chickens have come home to roost. It's not a positive phrase. It's actually seen in the idea of a person has done some things early on in life and now he's paying for them. It's an old, old phrase. As a matter of fact, uh, the idea comes from way back in 1390, Geoffrey Chaucer, he wrote in The Parson's Tale, a little bit different saying, but it resounds the same. That is this, such curses wrongfully returneth again to him that curseth, as a bird returneth again to his own nest. And you may be listening to that and go, that says nothing about chickens. Well, (laughs) that phrase was added in the 19th century, but it was along the same lines. Animals, in particular, birds, chickens, they return to their roost. And when they do, uh, we would call it the law of sowing and reaping, which is actually a much better way to put it. What a man sows, that shall he reap. What I've called this passage, uh, this sermon today, is rabbit's foot or repentance. I'll explain that. Rabbit's foot, is, it's interesting. It's not just seen in uh, the West. It's actually all throughout the world. Uh, it's an amulet uh, used by ancient cultures around the world to bring good luck. It was thought to carry special power. 
Well, for a believer, this is ridiculous. Uh, Not only that, but a humorist named R.E. Shea agrees, saying this, Depend on the rabbit's foot if you will, but remember, it didn't work for the rabbit. So, as a believer, uh, we can fall into this, what Dale Davis calls rabbit's foot theology. And I'll explain that. Um, But before I do, we should note this. I'll give you the correct view First, our justification before the Lord is by the cross of Christ alone for what He did for us, right? Died on the cross, went to be buried, three days later rose from the dead. That is your justification. That is the only goodness that you have before God. And at the point of being born again, God gives you, um, if you will, a two-sided coin. On one side is faith. For by grace you are saved through faith, not, not of yourselves, says in Ephesians 2.8. But not only that, but the other side is, is repentance. Uh, it's 2 Timothy 2.25, if perhaps God will grant them repentance. They're really, it's two different sides of the same coin. It's not an, it's not an added work. It's not uh, front-loading the gospel, as I've heard. It's a gift of God. Uh, the Hebrew word is, uh, that's most used for it is shub. It means to return. The idea is you're turning back from evil. In the New Testament, we would use the word metanoia. It's a change of heart that results in a change of action. Right? There's your justification. That's the fruit of justification. God gives you faith and repentance. Paul speaks about this in Acts 26.20 when he makes it clear that I not only preach this in Damascus, but in Jerusalem and throughout Judea and also to the Gentiles that they should repent right, and turn to God bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. So God calls us to do something, but He also provides the gifts themselves. That's justification. But what about our resulting sanctification? I would uh, tell you, according to the Scripture, it is also a life of continual faith and repentance. Uh, 1 John 1.9 uses a little different word. It doesn't use metanoia. It uses the word homologeo which means to confess. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as a believer, we keep short accounts with God. When we fall into sin, when we sin, we are quick to confess and we are to uh, homologeo. The idea is we agree. We say the same thing that God says about this sin. This is lust. This is gossip. This is slander. This is hating your brother in your heart. This is thievery. We fully admit, Lord, this is right, I was wrong, and I confess it. And we live this sort of life of faith and repentance. It's just a way of life as a believer. An initial justification, that's a gift of God. And even our resulting sanctification is a gift of God. So that's the right way to think about it. What were the Jews doing here? What were the Israelites? Well, it was more of a rabbit's foot theology. And quite honestly, as believers, we can fall into this if we're not careful Basically, you try to use the Lord. You use manipulation. Uh, you use superstition as a way to kind of curry favor with Him so He'll give you what you want, right? Um, sadly, this is what the Israelites did. And note this, they did this for years. But note this, they did this for years even after Samuel became a prophet, right? Right? So what you're going to note, let me take you, if you will, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 19, and then I want to show you something about uh, Samuel as we dive into 1 Samuel 4. 1 Samuel 3, 19. Uh, Thus Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail. All Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. What do you see there? This is a prophet of God. He knows the Word of God. He's proclaiming the Word of God. He's already told Eli, You're going to be, your house is going to be destroyed. He's warned Israel. Why do I tell you all that? Listen to me. You're not going to see Samuel in chapter 4, 5, and 6. Except the very first verse of chapter 4. He's gone. Where is he? Well, I think the Bible's being very clear about where he is. He's where the people, they, they want him to be, out of the room. They don't want the word of the Lord. 
They don't want to live by faith. They don't want to live by repentance. They want to live by rabbit's foot theology. Because I'll show you one last thing as we begin. 1 Samuel 7, you can turn there, verse 3 and 4. Once Samuel does appear, note what happens. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return, there's our word, to the Lord with all your heart, remove the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and direct your hearts to the Lord, and serve Him alone, and He will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the sons of Israel removed the Baals and the Ashtaroth, i.e., repentance, and serve the Lord alone. Faith. Two different sides of the same coin. And everything changes in 1 Samuel 7. But we're not there today. We're in 1 Samuel 4. So let's dive right in. So we see, thus the word of the Lord came to all Israel. He's confirmed as a prophet, but no one wants to hear from Samuel. You know why? Because this is the time of the judges, where everyone does what is right in his own eyes. So they don't want to hear from this boy who's becoming a man. They're not interested. So what happens? Verse 1 and 2. Now Israel went out to, the Philist to meet the Philistines in battle and camped beside Ebenezer, while the Philistines camped in Aphek. The Philistines drew up in battle array to meet Israel. When the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the battlefield. Well, who are these people, Philistines? Well, they, most people believe uh, they're immigrated from Crete. So they would probably look Greek, modern day Greek person. Uh, they owned five city-states. They are militarily more powerful than Israel, although the numbers are much smaller. The reason why is they had Greek military equipment made of iron, like helmets, shields, armors, uh, rather armor and swords. So Israel, note this, it's going out to meet the Philistines. When you go out to meet your enemy, the idea is you're going on the offensive. Now, just to give you context, Samuel is here, Eli is here, but what about Samson? We always focus Samson as on the book of Judges, and it is, but remember, this is the very end of the time period of Judges. So Samson's life and Samuel's probably intersected. Uh, and remember, in the life of Samson, the Philistines were still ruling, right? And they still are in this section. So Israel is trying to throw off their yoke of slavery. Notice there's no repentance. There's no, hey, let's go to Samuel. Let's talk about this first. Let's trust the Lord. He's got a word for us. Nope. So here's what happens. Uh, we have the Philistines are at Aphek, which is, uh, Aphek is a part of the modern coastal highway north of the Philistine cities. It's 20 miles west of Shiloh. We're going to see uh, the word Shiloh many times in here. Shiloh was kind of the provisional capital of Israel for about 300 years, from the time of Joshua till roughly the end of Samuel's life, or perhaps middle. Ebenezer is where Israel is. Ebenezer is called Stone of Help, but y'all, you don't have that name until 1 Samuel 7. So, but that is the same area that they were in, and that was probably east of Aphek. And they're going to battle. And note this, it's just very clear cut. The Philistines defeat them. They kill about 4,000 men on the battlefield. Now for you and I, we've gotten so used to perhaps reading through Scripture, you may have just glossed over that. But if you're an Israelite, your, uh, your mouth is wide open. Why? Because this is the promised land. The promised land belongs to Israel. The Philistines are interlopers. They don't belong there. Israel should win. There's no reason why Israel should lose. The Bible's very clear in the Pentateuch. Israel, if you follow me, you're going to win all the battles. This is the land that I've set aside for you. But if you remember the city of Ai, when Joshua comes and attacks it, they lose. Right? And Joshua had been told this is the promised land, and so he's crying out to the Lord. But then what is the Lord's response? Get up. Why is that you have fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. Point, there's sin in the camp. There's sin in the camp and y'all aren't dealing with it. Okay? So verse 3 and 4. When the people came into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us take to ourselves from Shiloh the ark of the covenant of the Lord, that it may come among us and deliver us from the power of our enemies. 
So the people sent to Shiloh, and from there they carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who sits above the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. All right, you know something's wrong when the first words that come out of the elder's mouth are, hmm, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant, <laughs> right? And not only that, they don't know why this has happened. Now, interestingly, this is a good question, but it's, they give a bad answer. They ask a really good question, why has this come upon us? And we should remember, number one, the Lord is sovereign, right? Amos 3.6, if a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people tremble? If a calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? Listen to me. Anything that happens in your life, whatever it may be, you can trust the Lord is doing His good purposes in you. It may be a result of your sin. It doesn't matter. God's sovereign, right? So that's what they're saying. We don't know why this has happened, but it has happened. So the Lord has approved this one. And yet, let me ask you a question. Did the Lord ever promise Israel defeat? Did He? Yeah, He did. Leviticus 26, 17 says this, If you do not obey Me and do not carry out all these commandments, I will set My face against you so that you will be struck down before your enemies. And those who hate you will rule over you. Deuteronomy 28, 25 says, in essence, the same thing. So what did they do? Well, they thought it would be a great idea to get the Ark of the Covenant and bring it into the battle. The Ark of the Covenant, just as a quick um, description, it was a small, sacred, gold covered. Uh, inside it contained the Ten Commandments. Also, Aaron's staff that had miraculously budded, and as, as well as a jar of manna. And really, the ark pointed to a few things. The Lord, He rules, He speaks, He forgives, He provides. If you remember, the Ark of the Covenant had a lid on it of pure gold, and it was called the mercy seat. It was sprinkled once a year with the blood of sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. Um... Once Israel got into the promised land from the wilderness, the average Israelite never saw the Ark of the Covenant. He never saw it. It's always in the Holy of Holies. What would he see? Well, he would see the Shekinah glory that would come up above uh, from the tabernacle, from the Ark. Um, we see that Shekinah glory going away, right, in Ezekiel 10, where God removes it as he removes his, his glory, if you will, from the people. But it's interesting because we don't know exactly at this time, and it is an argument from silence, was the Shekinah glory still seen by everybody at that time period? Uh, there's some debate on that. It may have been dissipated or maybe invisible because the people were not living the way they should live, so the Lord may have taken it away. Well, we know this. There's no special sense that Samuel has of the Lord, and he's living in the tabernacle. As a matter of fact, he's sleeping next to the ark. Uh, there was no indication of Samuel regarding the Lord. And so we, we don't really know. Uh, but note this. The people, the elders at least, go, let's go get that ark. It helped in the past. I'm sure it'll help in the future. Uh, remember when they went around Jericho, they were carrying the ark. The walls fell flat. They probably had some sort of uh, indications that this might be able to help them. And yet there's nothing in Scripture that says to do this. Right? The ark was a visible symbol of God's presence. But what was it for them? It was a lucky rabbit's foot. Right? Notice this. It, they even go further. That says that it may come among us. Or really, the Hebrew could just as easily note this. That He may come among us and deliver us from the power of our enemies. So the idea is, let's bring the ark into the camp and we'll go to battle and it will force the Lord to deliver us and protect His honor. Right? What do you call this? You call this superstitious manipulation. Right? To quote Davis again, one of the commentators, he says, uh, too many times our concern is not to seek God, but to control Him. Not to submit to God, but to use Him. Right? And that's why we have these uh, points in Scripture. 1 Timothy 4, 6, 16. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, he'll say. That means it's, it's not just enough to watch your doctrine, and you should watch your doctrine. But you better watch your life 
as well. I'm so thankful here. I've been at the chapel many years off and on, and I feel like uh, the Lord has just done many things in my life by the, the older people in here that have taught me the word and the doctrine has been amazing. Um, and it's good and it is right for us to know good doctrine. You ought to know it. That's the way you get to know the Lord better. And you, you, you don't hold to false views. It's very helpful. And yet beware. The power, as we see in the ark, the power of the ark is not in the ark. It's in the one whom the ark manifested. Right? So as believers, we need to remember that know your doctrine. Hold, watch your life and doctrine closely, but, but know if to know God rightly, the power is not in the doctrine, but in the one whom the doctrine speaks, right? Doesn't Jesus speak about this? John 5, 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it is they that bear witness, what? About me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Now beware, don't misquote me. Don't you dare misquote me at Believer's Chapel saying the doctrine is not vitally important. It is. And yet at the same time, be careful it's not more than a rabbit's foot theology for you. Your understanding of a doctrine is a way to control God, to use Him. Be careful. Be careful. The people sent to Shiloh, and from there they carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts who sits above the cherubim. There's one question that should be going through your mind when I said that statement. Where's Eli? Where's Eli? Why isn't he saying, don't you dare take that thing out of the Holy of Holies? No. We don't see him. As a matter of fact, it says, Hophni and Phinehas were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Okay, this, I can just tell you, is a bad decision. Hophni and Phinehas are doing lots of bad things, sleeping with the women of the tent. They're also, uh, they're eating, they're stealing the meat, sacrificial meat, and eating it from the people. I mean, this is like putting foxes guarding the hen house. This is unwise, all right? So not only that, but it's not just Hophni and Phinehas that are at fault. It's the people. The people. They've given way to this culture of rabbit's foot theology, superstition, uh, manipulation of God, or trying to as if we ever could manipulate God. I like what Matthew Henry writes about this because so, it's affected their worship, Right? He says, to worship the true God and not to worship Him as God is in effect not to worship Him at all. So basically, these people were somewhat like virtual agnostics. They give lip service to God. They seem to know some things about Him, but they live life the way they want to live it. Question, can we do that today? Is that possible for us to do that today? I like Spurgeon's quote. He, he thinks you can. He says, instead of attempting to get right with God, these Israelites set about devising superstitious means of securing the victory over their foes. In this respect, most of us have it imitated them. We think of a thousand inventions, but we neglect the one thing need, needful. They forgot the main matter, which is to enthrone God in life, to seek to do His will by faith in Christ Jesus, to get right with God, to confess thy sin. Right? I think perhaps in times past, we focused a little bit too much, perhaps, on uh, penitence, which we don't hold to as believers. We don't have to, we don't have to get God's attention by hurting ourselves to, to, to let Him know that we're really sorry. No, no, no. And yet at the same time, I think perhaps we've gone too far to the other extreme, that we don't note the, the importance of repentance in everyday life, confession. Psalmist will say in Psalm 66, 18, if I had regarded sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. He cares for us. He loves us. But we are holding too tightly to sin. We're not helping anybody. Verse 5 through 7, as the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth resounded. When the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what does the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. The Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Hmm. 
Woe to us. You know, it's interesting. The Philistines are scared to death. You know what's so ironic about that? The Israelites should be scared to death. The Bible says this in Deuteronomy 23, 14. He says, Since the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and defeat your enemies before you, therefore your camp must be holy, and he must not see anything indecent among you, or he will turn away from you. If these people knew their Bibles, they would go, wait a second. Are you sure you want to bring the Ark of the Covenant in here? I mean, remember the way we live these days. Each one of us does what is right in our own eyes. I don't think this is such a good idea. Well, continuing on, verse 8 and 9. Woe to us! Who shall deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who smote the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, or you will become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been slaves to you. Therefore, be men and fight. So we see three observations about the Philistines' response. One, they're polytheistic, many gods. Uh, they saw the true worship of the Lord as they saw their own. These are the gods, if you will, that destroyed Egypt. Number two, I think this is vitally important. They were aware in the sense that there was worldwide knowledge of what God, uh, the God of Israel did to Egypt. I think too many times on our cell phones in the 500 different ways we know how to communicate, which are none of them very good, sadly, uh, except for the person to person, the ancient world actually communicated perhaps much better than we realize. The Philistines, who were not from Egypt, they're from Crete. They knew all about what the God of Israel had done to Egypt. And number three, they were, if you will, courageous. There's something you can learn from a pagan here. Revelation 21.8 tells us, you know the first characteristic of those in hell? According to uh, Revelation 21.8, you might say unbelief, and that's actually the second one. You know what the first one is? The cowardly. The cowardly are in hell. Right? So we know that we are, we are uh, not Philistines. We have the Lord on our side. So we can say, as Joshua, be strong and courageous. Right? Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We got nothing to be scared about. Verse 10 and 11. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and every man fled to his tent, and the slaughter was very great, for there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Oh, this is terrible. 30,000 foot soldiers, ark of God taken. And then we see something really interesting. Hophni and Phinehas are dead. And that may not mean anything to you in this chapter, but in chapter 2, verse 34, 1 Samuel, that is the sign, the sign, that the house of Eli will be destroyed. Is Hophni and Phinehas will be killed on the same day. And there the word of the Lord is once again true. You know, there's great irony in this. Great irony. Israel seeks to manipulate Right? To use the Lord by bringing out the ark and secure victory. Note, the Lord actually is using the people to bring out Hophni and Phinehas to secure their death and to fulfill His word. So God even uh, allows, if you will, the wickedness of man to give Him glory. Right? You know, it's interesting, from an archaeological standpoint, in the late 1970s, there's a... There's a was found a broken piece of pottery the size of a man's palm. It was found in a grain silo in the ruins of Isbet Sarte, and it contained an account of this very battle. The capture of the ark, and even mentions Hophni by name. And I'll quote the fifth line. It says this, The companion of the foot soldiers, Hophni, came to tell the elders, A horse has come, and upon it my brother, for us to bury. So using a little imagination, we can see his brother's dead. He's on a horse. Hophni is coming into the battle. We don't know if the ark is yet taken, but we get the idea is Hophni is going back into the battle and he's going to get killed. What is so fascinating about this, this is the earliest known extra biblical reference to an Old Testament event. This potsherd is, is, is 5,000 years old. It's a thousand years before Christ. 
So what can we learn from this as believers? Uh, To quote Ralph Davis again, the Lord will allow you to be disappointed with Him if it will awaken you to the sort of God He really is. You see, whenever the church stops confessing thou art worthy and begins chanting thou art useful, well then, you know the ark of God has been captured again. Verse 12 and 13. Now a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he came, behold, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road, eagerly watching, because his heart was trembling for the ark of God. So the man came to tell it in the city, and all the city cried out. Interesting, right? Eagerly watching. Eagerly watching, that's a problem. Because Eli's blind. He can't see. And we're going to see that he is also not just physically blind, he's got some spiritual blindness going on as well. We, why is he so eager about this? Well, 1 Samuel 3.11, God will say, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. Listen to me. Eli's ears are beginning to tingle now. And he's scared perhaps for three reasons. Number one, he knew the prophecy. He knew the prophecy. Your sons are going to die on the same day, and when that happens, your house is destroyed. Number two, he knew that taking the ark into the battle was with his wicked sons was a horrible idea. If you will, Eli sent his own sons out to their deaths. And number three, I'm of the opinion that Eli is not repentant. Um, he's, uh, when the man of God came to him in chapter 2, uh, he says virtually nothing. In 1 Samuel 3, where Samuel is sent to speak to him. He basically says, let the Lord do what's right in his own eyes. But he doesn't fix things. He hasn't fixed anything. And what's happening here? The chickens have come home to roost. Verse 14 through 16. When Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, what does the noise of this commotion mean? Then the man came hurriedly and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were set so that he could not see. The man said to Eli, I am the one who came from the battle line. Indeed, I escaped from the battle line today. And he said, how did things go, my son? You will see here, it it kind of throws this in. Eli was 98. His eyes were set so he could not see. So the, the author, which is the Spirit, wants the reader to know once again to build suspense. Uh... Eli can't see. He's not catching any of this. And yet, you should know this. When uh, an army lost the battle back at that time, and even it's true today, it's a sensory overload. At that time, there would be dust in the air flying through the air. People were throwing it on their heads. Clothes, we would hear the sound of them being ripped. People not just weeping, but howling in pain. And Eli is hearing all this and even smelling this and but he can't see it. So he asks, how did things go, my son? Listen, as a believer, we need to be careful. There's physical blindness and there is spiritual blindness. Now, as a believer, you can never be spiritually blind. You can't. I mean, it's God opened the eyes of you when He, uh, when he bore you up again, when you're regenerated. Yet, can a believer be partly blind? Can he be affected in his vision? Sure he can. 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul will say, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. He doesn't think they can lose their salvation. No, of course, none of this. But be careful, because Satan himself can, uh, can lead us astray. Be careful. Verse 17 and 18, Then the one who brought the news replied, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great slaughter among the people. And your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been taken. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell off the seat backward beside the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for he was old and heavy. Thus he judged Israel forty years. Hmm... Very strange. Jeremiah 7 tells us that the Philistines also destroyed Shiloh 
we're not going to see Shiloh come up again regarding to where the ark is going to be. It's going to go to a different place here soon, but not Shiloh. And there's four tough statements that take place here. Number one, Israel's, they fled. Number two, great slaughter. Number three, your sons are dead. But what is it that made Eli fall back and die? The ark of God is taken. Matthew Henry says, his heart gives out and then his neck. I can't help but wonder if Solomon may have written about Eli, uh, perhaps by inspiration of the Spirit. He says in Proverbs 29.1, A man who hardens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken beyond remedy. Eli had been warned time and time again, and he would not restrain his sons. He would not. And, and not only that, do you notice something about his physical aspect? He's seen as heavy. Um, what is the, why is that there, right? It's kind of a strange thing to add, perhaps. And yet I do think it's, it's an allusion to 1 Samuel 2.29, where a prophet pronounces judgment on the house of Eli, and yet he includes Eli somewhat in the sin of his sons. And he says to Eli, Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I've commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me? by making yourselves fat with the choices of every offering of my people Israel. What's going on there? Well, it seems that Eli perhaps was eating some of this sacrificial meat that his sons had stolen, and he was kind of enjoying the benefits of his son's own sin. Maybe that's why he became heavy. You find out one other thing you have not known at all. Did you catch it? He's judged Israel 40 years. And you might go, huh? I don't think he's doing a very good job, right? Um, it's the first time we see this, and it's really sad. And Eli is kind of a shattered life, if you will, and it's something for us to learn from. He does a bad job as a priest. He does a bad job as a father. He does a bad job as a judge. And yet note this, be careful. It doesn't mean he's an unbeliever. Not at all. I've been working on this dissertation for what seems like a very long time. But it's interesting because I've noted the number of Christian men, heroes in the faith, whom I love. But some of them held to a perpetual black slavery uh, and or segregation. Uh, men like Jonathan Edwards and, and Richard Furman, Charles Hodge and Bob Jones. How do you explain that? Well, I think you explain it the same way. Hopefully, you'd explain it in your own life. We have blind spots, terrible blind spots that we don't see sometimes, right? This is where we get into accidents, in, in not only on the freeway, but in, but in life. Um, and, and we need to be careful with Eli. Be too, don't be too quick to judge him, condemn him. Uh, I think when you study history, there's two extremes to studying history, and, and we tend to fall off on one side or the other. One is whitewashing. That means you never point out the sins of others. You don't. You can't do that. That's, that's bad. That's negative. No, it's not bad. No, you can learn from them. Not only the great doctrine that these men had, but you can also learn from some of their mistakes, the sins. Or, or the other extreme would be presentism that you may not be as familiar with, but it's a great term to know. Historian Thomas Kidd defines it as Quote, a tendency to assess historical figures based on the norms and habits of today. He calls it one of America's favorite pastimes, establishing their moral superiority by denouncing dead people. Right? What is another term for that? It's pride. Um, you think, how could I would have never done this? Oh, Eli, you're so wicked. And he didn't do many things right. But be careful, right? If you find yourself questioning other believers, instead maybe ask another question. What's an area of my life that doesn't reflect Christ? Verse 19 and 20. Now his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was pregnant and about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband had died, she kneeled down and gave birth, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, Do not be... Do not be afraid, for you have given birth to a son. But she did not answer or pay attention. It seems that the horror and stress of losing a husband, a father-in-law, a brother-in-law, 
The ark is gone. That, that sent her into forced labor. Uh, it's interesting that the women who cared for her says, don't be afraid. What is, what is that about? Well, perhaps they knew she was dying. And she said, they're saying, hey, your whole family may be dead, but your name lives on in your son. But note this, she doesn't even pay attention. It's like she's looking at them going, who cares? There's no future without the Lord's glory. And finally, verse 21 and 22, And she called the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God was taken. Ichabod. Uh, the, the Hebrew word kabod is glory. Ich, no glory. Or where is the glory? So the question is, has the glory of Israel departed Israel, the glory of Israel? It, it, in some sense, true. Yeah, the, the Ark of the Covenant is gone. They, they may have seen it leave and realized they could not, couldn't get it back. The glory of the Lord is gone. And yet, in another sense, no. In another sense, the glory had already departed Israel when Israel decided to stop living for the Lord. The sort of confessing, trusting the Lord. Instead, they've decided to use tools like manipulation, superstition, as their way to get what they wanted in life. Rabbit foot theology. In conclusion, I'd like to conclude with some questions, in particular about the glory departing. Number one, can the glory of the Lord depart from a church? I mean, is that possible? Well, sure. Read Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3. Jesus threatens to take away His lampstand. Why would He take away His lampstand? It seems they're not living for the Lord. They're not preaching His gospel. They're teaching a different gospel. And I have no doubt there are churches all over Dallas that you could put the word Ichabod on the front marquee. Glory is departed. Thankfully, that is not this church by God's grace alone. Number two, can the glory of the Lord depart from a believer if he is in a particular sin? Uh, no, of course not. Isaiah 43, 7, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. God created you for his glory. He elected you before the foundation of the world. And Jesus himself will say in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Glory of the Lord can't depart from you. The Spirit of God can't depart from you if you're a true believer. And then the third question, can the glory of the Lord feel as if it is departing from a believer as he engages in sin unrepentantly? Can it feel that way? Sure it can. 2 Peter 1.9, Peter warns by inspiration of the Spirit, a believer can be short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Be careful. Don't be a forgetful person. Stay in His Word. Two more questions. Number four, did the Lord lose in this chapter? I mean, looking from the outside in, you go, well, this kind of looks like a loss to me. No, 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 no. He begins now the process of restoration. The Philistines are going to be judged for their thievery. The Lord has removed His false shepherds, Hophni and Phinehas. Eli is now in heaven. <laughs> Can't cause any more troubles. The Lord will no longer be despised in the city of Shiloh because He has destroyed it through the Philistines. And the ark of the Lord, now on the move, eventually will be placed where the Lord wants it, at its home in Jerusalem by the man of God's own heart. And by the way, as a side note here, does the Lord ever lose? Does He ever lose? Of course not. Isaiah 46.10 makes this very clear, determining the ends from the beginning, from ancient times, what is to come. I will accomplish all that I please. And if you are not yet come to Christ today, let me tell you this. Hmm. Acts 2.23, this man, meaning Christ, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Listen to me. Your sin put him on the cross. And yet, before time even began, it was determined that He is the one who would be chosen of the three of the Godhead who would lay down His life. You need to know this if you're an unbeliever today. Your sin is putrid in God's sight. 
and you have sinned, and you are a sinner, and you will always continue to keep sinning. You cannot reform yourself. Let me give you worse news. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. You're going to pay for this sin. You can't just say, I'm sorry. Something has to pay for your sin. And it's either going to be you, or it's going to be God's own son. Right? Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. God sent His only begotten Son into the world, lived the perfect life you and I could never live. Died on the cross three days later, rose from the dead. There's the man, behold the man, the only one who can make you right with God the Father. But you know, that's not enough to know that. You have to come to a place in life that you are trusting in Christ alone for your salvation. It says in Luke 24, 47, the Great Commission, repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name beginning at Jerusalem. Guess where it's being preached right now? All over the world. And for you, Dallas, Texas. Your role is to do nothing more. The only thing you can give Christ is your sin. Handing it off to Him. You're never going to be perfect. You're just simply saying, I'm going to turn away from the gods of my life the way that somehow I thought I could get to heaven and I am trusting in Christ alone for my salvation. And one day the sky will rent, and we will see Christ coming in the clouds. And so we shall forever be with the Lord. For those that are believers, what's the moral of the story? Well, when a believer stops using the double-barreled shotgun of trusting the Lord in His Word, and number two, of repenting from sin, living a life of confession, the believer begins to seek out manipulative, superstitious ways to try and make the Lord do His will. That person soon finds frustration is the way of life. I'm going to pray for us, and then we will sing hymn number 10. All praise to Him. Please join me in prayer. Father, we give You thanks for Your Word. Thank You for Your grace and Your mercies that are new every morning. I pray for anybody in here that does not yet know the Savior. Would You grant them repentance, faith, and they would believe today and trust you. In your son's name we pray it. Amen. I would like to take a few moments to uh, make a few comments about the redemption we have in Christ Jesus and then give thanks for the bread. In ancient Greece and Rome, prisoners of war who had been captured in battle were sometimes released for a price. The process was called redemption. Anyone who carried it out was a redeemer. The sum of money paid for the release of the captive was called the ransom. Jesus himself told us that redemption was the reason for his coming to earth. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. To release the captives of sin, he paid the price. We were in captivity to sin. We were in the strong grip of evil. We could not break free. But the price was paid by the death of Christ, and as a result, we go free. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. To accomplish the atonement for sin, the price was paid by Christ who gave himself and his life. In 1 Timothy 2, Paul writes that Christ Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all. And in Titus 2, Paul Paul writes that he gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. Finally, redemption draws our attention to the person of our Redeemer. Because he bought us with his life, Christ Jesus is Lord over every believer. In Revelation 5, verse 9, the Song of the Lamb celebrates the deliverance of sinners from sin through Christ and anticipates the final glorious redemption we have in Him. Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. If you believe that Christ Jesus is your redeemer and that he has paid the ransom for your sins, we invite you to participate 
in this Lord's Supper as a remembrance of our Lord's sacrificial death on the cross. Let me give thanks for the bread. Dear Father, we thank you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus, to redeem us and to pay the ransom for our sin. Help us never to forget that we were captives to sin, and that the price paid for our redemption was the sacrificial death of Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. Help us to remember the ransom price he willingly paid to set us free from our sins. We also thank you for the grace given to us to believe in Christ's redemptive sacrifice for us. And now we ask that you bless us as we partake of the bread, which is the symbol of the body of the Lord Jesus, broken to save his people from their sins. In Christ's name, amen. From Colossians 1, 19 and 20, we read, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross, through Him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. You caught it, didn't you? Him. It's Christ. Christ alone. Three points I'll make. Number one, made peace. He made peace between God and man. Not only that, he made peace between man and man. In the age that we presently live, the Bible is very clear. He made neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean the differences in ethnicities go away, but it means that we are one in Christ but most importantly, he made us one with, between God and man, that he gave us peace. Because before that time, there was nothing more than propitiation. Uh, that, that rather, God's wrath laid upon us. But God, the Son, absorbed God's wrath for us. You cannot absorb God's wrath. It's not possible. You're not deity. You're not perfect. And the best you can do one day would be to somehow endure God's wrath for eternity, never for it to stop. But if you are in Christ, your wrath has been absorbed in the Son. Number two, through the blood of His cross, it's a symbol of His death. In just a moment, when we take the cup, we will memorialize His blood that was shed for us. And we drink it as a memorial in the sense that his blood is given for us and we imbibe it, right? And Christ is very clear. If you don't have the bread and the blood, you don't have the Son. So it's an inst instrument, the cross, to bring us to God and the blood that was shed out. And finally, number three is reconciled all things. Did you catch that? All things. Things in heaven, or rather things on earth and in heaven. Well, that's, is that all things? He didn't say anything about hell. He doesn't reconcile hell. He doesn't reconcile those that are not in Christ. He only reconciles those who are in Him. So rejoice. You are in Him today if you are a Christian. Let's pray. Father, we give You thanks for the cup. Thank You, Father, for the blood shed for us that in Him alone we have uh, our righteousness. In Your Son's name we pray it. Amen. Well, this concludes our service today. Now him to, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. You are dismissed.